Thus, um, uh, we're going to cover today how to optimize your infusion test and uh, some strategies about how to do that to increase productivity and manage risk. My name is Jerry Zion. I'm the global training manager for Fluke Biomedical. I, am, uh, I also serve as an infusion device test expert here, have over 40 years of experience in healthcare and medical devices all in, and I am a certified biomedical equipment technician. We'll cover how to select the best infusion pump test method, common errors associated with testing in all the methods possible that are, that are available, and how to optimize your strategy. So why do we even test infusion devices in the first place? Um, part of it is because accurate analysis of the infusion pump and its performance is critical to patient care. Um, it turns out that between 2005 and 2009, just in the United States alone, we had over 56,000 adverse events. In that 56,000, over 500 deaths and 87 recalls across all of the manufacturers of infusion devices that are sold in the United States. Incorrect readings from a poorly performing infusion pump could put the patient at a greater health risk, including death. So uh, no matter what, what has been said about infusion device testing, and especially for those of you that think that your hospital is uh, somehow risk protected by you're not touching the infusion devices that are placed in your facility um, on the basis of a contract for infusion sets and the fluid bags, guess again, you are held medical legally responsible as the end user of these devices and you should test them. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. When we test, in order to ensure the proper performance for safe and effective clinical use of these infusion devices, the things that we want to include and look at are the physical condition of the infusion device. Filters, vents are clean, things like uh, physical damage, display intensity is adequate, labels and warnings are present and legible, um, so forth. We also will be doing electrical safety testing even if the infusion device is battery powered. So it's being powered from an internal power supply. We call that electrical safety class IP, internal power. And even if we're doing testing there, we need to perform a leakage current measurement test at minimum, and that's called touch current. Um, there's more about that in the electrical safety uh, testing training that we provide in our Advantage Training Center. Preventive maintenance, there are things that need to be cleaned or replaced, um, including batteries. Um, so no matter what the chemistry is, about every two years you ought to think about replacing the batteries. Even if you think your hospital doesn't own these infusion devices, someone needs to do this. So it's possible that you might have an exchange program where if there's a problem with the infusion device on the basis of that contract for the infusion sets and the fluid bags, you get to send that infusion device back to that provider and get a different one in its place. Fine, go ahead and do that, but realize you need to test um, the incoming infusion device at least for electrical safety and that physical inspection in, on the incoming, um, as an incoming inspection or acceptance test. You need to do the performance testing, which will include the pole clamp functionality for these things often are uh, designed with a pole clamp that will clamp to an infusion uh, pole, a, pole, a roll stand. Um, one of the things that we always took a look at here is that the wheelbase uh, of that roll stand was adequate so that there was no uh, risk of the infusion device tipping over accidentally and hurting someone or damaging the infusion device. We're going to check flow and volume accuracy, infusion uh, complete or KVO. KVO is a term that means keep vessel open. It's a particular report that uh, report out in a display that you'll see on the infusion device, it'll go to uh, a message that says KVO at the end of each infusion. 
we're going to do the occlusion detection pressure measurement. And in this case, we're really talking about a downstream or uh, 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 occlusion that occurs near the patient as opposed to upstream occlusions that occur above the infusion device, uh, between the infusion device and the fluid bag. Piggyback infusion functionality, um, and by this we mean normally a patient will have a fluid bag. It could be dextrose uh, and, and water, it could be normal saline. Uh, it is simply a carrier um, to infuse fluid volume for the patient, but often the uh, doctor may order uh, antibiotics or something like that to be infused as a piggyback. It'll be a smaller bag of uh, of medication, and that will be run in on a, at a faster infusion uh, flow rate uh, at a smaller volume. So it's done very quickly, goes in very quickly, and then the infusion pump automatically reverts to the programming for the larger fluid bag. We want to make sure that functionality works properly and that all alarm functions are working and any other model-specific preventive uh, performance testing that is prescribed by the manufacturer of the infusion pump. We'll want to document all of our test results, uh, visual and so forth, uh, not only with uh, pass-fail, not applicable checklists, but with actual evaluations of measurements that we're going to make with some sort of technology, measurement technology. Um, there'll be testing limits that will be applied so that we can assess whether that performance is within the uh, uh, test boundaries established by either the manufacturer in their uh, service manual procedure, test procedure, or by the international or local and national standards for infusion devices for safe and effective uh, use. We're also going to uh, try and use forms of documentation that um, reduce human error sources and allow us to standardize our workflow so everybody does the testing in the same sequence of tests, not everybody does whatever they feel like doing. And then we want to archive that information, hopefully pulling it into a computerized maintenance management system, CMMS, which is a database so that we can track the failures and come up with a mean time between failure calculation as well as a, uh, an assessment, a longer term trend assessment of, uh, that gets us to predictive maintenance, the ability to predict that failures are about to happen, hopefully before they happen, but at least while they're less expensive to repair. Let's talk a little bit about pump test, uh, infusion pump testing methods. We've done a survey, and the survey has indicated to us that um, there are two high-level divisions here in terms of how pumps are tested. The, the testing uh, happens. Manual methods seem to be about 45% of all of us here in the U.S., whereas electronic analyzes are used by 55% of us, so a little over half. Um, the manual methods have some drawbacks, as do the electronic analyzers. So we're going to take a look at the pros and cons of each. So for flow and volume accuracy, there are three different general testing technologies and methods that can be used. The first is a basic level. At a basic level, you could use a graduate, graduated burette, um, and this is sometimes used, or this is certainly used to measure volume, that is the fluid co collected in that burette, but also uh, combine that with a stopwatch to calculate the uh, flow rate at, that fills that volume into the burette. So there are some sources for human error here, um, that can't be avoided and that are that may be problematic. And we certainly can overcome by the use of a different technology. Perhaps a better and more accurate technology would be a beaker and balance or beaker and scale. 
Um, that gives us a volumetric collection uh, 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 within the beaker, but it also gives us a gravimetric determination because of the scale. So what we would do there is make sure we have zeroed the scale with the beaker on the scale so that we um, ignore, are able to ignore the volume of the beaker, empty beaker to begin with. Then all of the difference in volume and gravimetric weight is going to be caused by the volume of fluid that flows into that beaker within a period, a period of time. So again, we would use a stopwatch to measure the flow rate um, that uh, during the time that the beaker is filled. Um, the scale may be connected to PC software, or it may not. Uh, you may have PC software that simply requires that an entry be typed in, keyboarded in one way or another um, into that software. So there are strengths and weaknesses to this one also. Uh, a, a little less in terms of uh, human error uh, uh, problems, but a lot more in terms of uh, ability, portability, uh, maintenance of accuracy if you're going to carry it around to different places, things like that. When we look at a best case scenario, the best case scenario might be created or delivered by an electronic calibrated uh, burette. Um, so no need for a stopwatch in this case because it's possible to measure the flow rate as well as the volume as it goes in. And oh, by the way, ongoing back pressure in the system so that we can always tell kind of how much, how hard this infusion device is working and it might give us some clues as to what we're going to run into when we do that occlusion test. So let's take a little closer look here at a graduated burette and the pros and cons of using this technology. It certainly has a short learning curve because basically what you're doing is making sure you can start that stopwatch as soon as the infusion device starts pushing fluid into the burette and then stop it when the infusion pump stops pushing and goes to KVO. Remember KVO is? Yep, that's right, keep vessel open. It's easy to operate, it's manual, and it's certainly affordable, no arguments there. So all of those are the pros for this. But some of the cons are a high error potential, and the reason for that is you're going to read a meniscus of the fluid volume that is uh, that has been pumped into the burette. And if, as long as that volume falls exactly on a markation on that burette, you're good to go. I mean, you're gonna have a very accurate reading. However, if it's in between graduations, then you're interpreting, you're interpolating, and that means you're guessing. And a guess is not good enough for medical devices, not by any stretch of the imagination. So there are some really big problems here in terms of the accuracy of your measurement, especially when that measurement falls between graduations. Uh, longer testing time, because you're going to be stuck there in front of this burette and using your stopwatch and timing until this volume has been delivered. So bigger volumes take longer time to push in. If you're going to do more than one test volume setting, then you're going to be sitting there for a longer period of time. You have to be careful that there is no residual volume in the tube because, uh, it, it, because if there is, that is volume that never made it into the burette and therefore goes unmeasured. So you can under report. So you don't want to do that. Still, another measure, uh, other measurement devices are needed to complete the, the measurement part of the preventive maintenance, and that means the stopwatch, for example. Let's take a look at the beaker and balance or beaker and scale, if you prefer. Um, pros and cons. Um, beakers and scales are pretty easy to set up. As I said before, you're going to put the empty beaker, empty and dry beaker, on the scale you're going to zero the scale for that weight uh, of the beaker, empty beaker, and then everything else in terms of weight will be only about the 
volume that is collected in the beaker. So pretty easy to set up, pretty minimal training, short learning curve. It's certainly accurate as long as it sits in one place and is not moved. When you move a scale, all bets are off. You have to at least re-zero it. If you can't re-zero it, it needs to be repaired. Um, so these things don't travel very well. They are meant to be laboratory measurement devices. They are not really need to be portable in any by any means. So typically what will happen is you're going to bring all your infusion devices down to or to whatever location you have this beaker and scale set up and you're going to have to do all of your testing in just one location. So that's a part of the con about this. Uh, repeatability and accuracy may have some variability uh, if you're not careful or if you're moving it around a lot. Otherwise, if you're leaving it in one place, uh, really about the only thing that, uh, that happens is if you're doing a very long infusion delivery over a long period of time and there are some temperature variations that might cause evaporation, then you, you could have some underreporting due to evaporation of volume. But that would be a really long period of time, uh, typically. So uh, it's more about just making sure that this thing is set up once, it's left in place, and you don't move it around. Uh, residual volume uh, might collect in the tube. Again, some underreporting in that case. Prone to human error um, less. Uh, but you still need other gadgets to complete the uh, other testing that needs to be done. Ergo, the stopwatch in order to get flow rate. Uh, let's go back just for a second. The other thing I want to cover here is that those softwares or the reporting that's required by a manufacturer where they would prefer to have a gravimetric measurement, a measurement of the mass of the fluid that has, or weight, if you will, um, of the fluid volume as the report, then uh, it turns out that one milliliter of water, and we're going to use water as our infusate for purposes of testing, even if we're testing an enteral feeding pump, by the way, one milliliter of water weighs exactly one gram of uh, in terms of gram weight. So you can use that if you're using a graduated burette, you don't have a beaker and a scale, or if you're using an electronic burette uh, in the electronic analyzer, you can use that milliliter of, of measurement of uh, volume uh, as if it were gram weight. You just take the same value and instead of reporting it as an ml, you report it as a gram, and you're okay with that. That is textbook chemistry. If you wanna check that out, go to any, any chemistry handbook and, and it will tell you exactly what I just said. You can Google it as well, by the way, we did. Uh, fall, uh, flow volume tests using an electronic analyzer. Here our pros are immediate uh, issue recognition because you're looking at the uh, sample by sample change in the reported right on the display screen. Uh, we're reducing human error because the, all of the measurements are made by the device, including the flow rate. You don't need a separate stopwatch here. It's all gonna be uh, calculated properly in the technology. You can standardize the work, especially here in, in this particular analyzer. It has uh, 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 auto sequence template that you can create branded model specific to each different model of infusion device you may have. Uh, it increases your productivity because it will allow you to do more than one channel of infusion testing at a time. In this case, up to four in a single uh, electronic analyzer. And that could be a four channel, single four channel infusion pump it could be two two-channel infusion pumps or four one-channel infusion pumps. There's th This allows you to do a little bit of batch testing just using the analyzer alone. So this increases your productivity and reduces your testing time, which should make everybody happy because 
who wants to sit around for long periods of time just watching water drip? I mean, I don't want to. So some of the cons, however, yes, there are drawbacks here. Um, you have a, might have a slightly longer learning curve. A residual volume in the tube still could cause underreporting, and it may cost more initially, but over time it will actually end up saving you investment uh, in, in additional devices. So uh, it could have, this could be both a pro and a con in terms of the cost issue. Test methods for measuring pressure. So this is the back pressure moment by moment that we want to be able to see because it gives us a little early warning about things that are happening uh, in the infusion device as it's pumping. Or it could be about the uh, occlusion pressure that is that that uh, safe that uh, uh, downstream occlusion measurement that we want to make. So basic technology here would be a high accuracy analog pressure gauge might be uh, a little bit better might be to use a digital pressure meter and that would be even if that was standalone and not part of a a larger electronic analyzer, it still would give you better accuracy and repeatability. And the best would be um, to incorporate this measurement into the electronic infusion device analyzer so that you can see that back pressure um, uh, moment by moment as each of the uh, samples come in uh, during the time that we're infusing the um, uh, volume from the infusion pump. So again, a little bit different way to look at strengths and weaknesses here for the analog gauge or digital pressure meter. Strengths here are highly accurate, long, uh, short learning curve, familiar, familiar to most people who are doing the testing. However, weaknesses are it is not typically automatable. In other words, you can't just automatically transfer the measurements moment to moment from those kinds of devices. Might be able to in a digital, digital pressure meter if you have the remote command set and if you have a software that can collect the information. It requires the operator to be dedicated to testing. So again, uh, single channel by single channel here. So in this case, I hope you would have a lot of analog gauges or a lot of digital pressure meters when you're doing the pressure part of the test. Limited to testing one channel at a time. Uh, for electronic device, uh, infusion device analyzers, this adds pressure testing to the flow volume strengths simultaneously with those strengths as well as that downstream occlusion test that needs to be done. We would reduce manual uh, errors here because the, the, it's pretty easy to, to set up. Total testing time reduction potential, this is fully automatable. Uh, so you have capability for uh, standardized work as well as time savings. All right, so how do we put all of this together to optimize our infusion testing strategy? Where what we want to do is we want to measure three or ma manage three things here: risk to the patient, compliance to standards or the manufacturer's testing procedure and reducing the cost of ownership of the infusion device um, so that we get to identify uh, repairs that need to be done early while they're easy and inexpensive to um, correct. All right, we talk about risk. Well, how do we figure out what is the risk? We have in our medical equipment quality assurance uh, procedure uh, uh, programs and uh, procedures textbook uh, from the University of Vermont, a very nice little worksheet here that is risk based and an assessment of the medical device. And mostly the University of Vermont uses this to verify the inspection frequency recommended by the manufacturer in a little different way than the manufacturer would have come up with that. In our case, it not only serves that purpose all right, uh, but it also gives us an idea about how 
we are, we are understanding what the risk uh, to the patient is and uh, what, is, what are the problems and how much avoidance, problem avoidance do we get. So let's just go over this for a minute. The light blue rows are the risk criteria. Uh, the clinical function means how invasive is it uh, is the connection to the patient. And this goes from non-invasive to uh, totally invasive for the patient. And what we're going to do there to get to the uh, risk-based assessment of, for frequency of inspection is pick one of those uh, rows that are in white uh, for that um, uh, for that criteria and, and, and just move that over to the score column. But this clinical function means how invasive is it to the patient? Physical risk is how bad would it be? What, what additional risk is impacting on the patient if a failure of the medical device occurs while the patient is connected to it? So for example, in this case, um, University of Vermont felt that for an infusion device, the device failure would result in an inappropriate delivery of therapy, a misdiagnosis, or a loss of monitoring. But I can think of at least one and maybe two scenarios where an infusion device is pumping a very potent medication um, one way or another. So let's just take a look at that for a minute. What if the, med the infusion device is pumping chemotherapy uh, medication to a cancer patient. How risky is it for that cancer patient if the pump fails while it's connected to the patient and fails either in an over delivery of the chemo or an under delivery of the chemo? An over delivery of the chemo might even kill the patient certainly going to make the patient very, very, very much more sick than they would normally otherwise be. And under delivery of the patient, oh, by the way, we certainly killed the cancer, right? But an under delivery might result in, we didn't really kill the cancer, but we really made the patient really sick. So those two possibilities there don't make me want to pick number three in that category. What it makes me want to do is pick number four. Device failure could result in severe injury or death of the patient. So it adds to our, uh, our score when we're trying to figure out frequency of inspection, how often we need to test. But it also tells me more about how risky could it be for, uh, for the patient and a device failure with an infusion device. Much different criteria all to begin uh, uh, assessment here altogether if we're just thinking about an infusion pump on a general med surge floor where it's just delivering that fluid volume to the patient, maybe some antibiotic or something, but nothing really risky. Totally different situation there than the chemotherapy patient. And what about the opioid delivery? So pain management, all right? Um, <clears throat> that delivery, once again, <clears throat> those medications are volatile or potent enough that they can result in death. They certainly can result in injury. So we need to really think about where is this infusion pump being used primarily? And it could be that we can't figure that out because the infusion pumps move around all the time. Well, then we ought to be uh, determining the risk here that we could reduce in the worst case scenario and start thinking about worst case as opposed to best case. That gives us a different perspective and a different level of importance for doing the testing on the medical device. Problem avoidance probability comes from our database, our CMMS, and tracking failures. How often do failures occur? Does preventive maintenance actually help us reduce that frequency of failure? And uh, what would be what would be be able to do if we track that for a long term to get to more of predictive maintenance? That is, seeing things that lead us to that will lead to a, a bigger failure that will cost more to repair, and instead repairing it early when the costs are lower. 
So problem avoidance probability is really about what are the what is the data in our own database about this model, Brandon model of a medical device tell us, is that a Brandon model we're going to keep recommending for as a standard medical device that's going to go into our inventory and be in use all over the hospital, yes or no. Incident history is, have there ever been any incidents that caused an injury or death or that could have caught it, caused an injury or death? And the answer here is yes or no. And the place that you can find this information is, uh, for example, on the US FDA website uh, by looking uh, uh, for device recalls or device corrective actions. And it's easy to get to, it's free, you can get to it from anywhere in the world. And the US FDA certainly has global reach because any manufacturer who wishes to sell their medical device in the United States must receive a clearance to market from the US FDA before they are allowed to bring that product into the United States market. So that certainly touches a very broad swath of medical device manufacturers around the world. So it's a good place for us to go take a look about have there ever been incidents of injury or death for this particular category or for this particular brand and model of medical device. Other place that you could go and look for that information might be the ECRI or ICRI if you prefer um, database and that you have to pay a subscription to and it's pretty, pretty expensive. So in a lot of cases, uh, the hospital biomed department can't afford that. That's why I always recommend the US FDA website because it's, uh, it's a pretty good bet. So that's a yes or a no. Have there been or have there not been? Are there, the next category is manufacturing, uh, manufacturers regulations and specs or um, requirements from the standards. And the answer here is yes or no. And almost every time, I can't think of very many medical devices that are not covered by one or both uh, the manufacturer and international standards or local national standards. In any case, this should always be yes, there are. So again, this gives you a nice assessment that's risk-based, gives you a different perspective about uh, how you should be thinking about the uh, importance of doing testing on the medical device, and it also can give you a cross-check as to how often you ought to be doing the preventive maintenance and testing. So consider automating. Well, why test automation? It speeds real-time uh, test results, reduces human error through electronic data collection and transfer. Oh, by the way, can reach out and automatically configure your test instrument for the test that needs to be done, another reduction in source of human error. It uh, ensures regulatory compliance uh, because it helps you properly document your testing, including failures. It creates electronic archives of all preventive maintenance and repair records so you can easily take a look at them in terms of traceability and in terms of uh, analyzing them at a future time, because you're going to keep this information in a database, not in paper files in a cabinet someplace. The data extraction offers trending and analysis and reporting of capability, including figuring out that uh, nirvana of uh, predictive maintenance, uh, so we can keep the cost of ownership low and the availability of the medical device for clinical use very high. Efficiency, quality, cost reduction, improving forecasting. Um, I'll just let you read through this slide. Think about batch testing as opposed to single channel, one at a time testing. <clears throat> now let's talk a little bit about batch testing. If it took me 22 minutes to do a full preventive maintenance on an infusion device, then, and I can only test one channel or one device at a time, it will take me, now I'm limited to one device every 22 minutes. If on the other hand, I can test multiple channels at the same time, or use software and create multiple instances of my 
uh, automated workflow and testing procedure so that I can produce a separate test report for each of four infusion pumps, for example, in that same 22 minutes, I have made myself four times as productive as the single channel method. And I'm getting through that big number of infusion devices that are in my hospital inventory faster so that I can get done with my workday, right? From a, from a person's point of view that is doing the testing. From the manager's point of view, time is money. So that is a cost savings represented to, represented to me. And uh, it, I can get more information about that using something car, called an ROI, a return on investment calculator. And if you take a look at this, and by the way, we're happy to have uh, one of our representatives come and visit and provide such an assessment for you with your own information about infusion device testing. But in this case, uh, the monetary savings per year was $7,000. Believe me, that's more than enough to be able to buy one more in electronic infusion device analyzer. So uh, it pays for itself within the year or it pays for one more additional one uh, should you need it based on the number of infusion devices that need to be tested. All right, so let's take a look at the latest. This is a little pitch, uh, a little information about our own product. Uh, we have a long track record, over 20 years of demonstrated accuracy and reliability in our infusion devices, device analyzers that we've put into the market over the years. We have great technology here. This has got this 20 year proven track record for flow measurement using a electronic graduated burette. So for example, each of these is an infrared sensor with virtually no space in between each of the sensors. So we have a very high accuracy of how much volume is being collected in this tube. And if our, in, if our volume to be delivered is more than the tube will hold, it simply empties the tube completely and then refills the tube and our measurement time is very, very quick. At the same time that we're measuring volume here, we're also measuring flow rate of that volume being filling the tube. So we're measuring the flow rate, measuring the volume delivery, and we're also simultaneously measuring the back pressure on the pump so that we're always able to have that determination of things that are beginning to change in a negative way. We can see it based on the back pressure measurement. This is all simultaneously happening. No stopwatch needed because it's all built in. Then we have the IDA-1S infusion device analyzer. This one, what you got a lot of this one is, it's battery powered. That means it can go anywhere. It doesn't necessarily need its power cord just to operate. And so if you got a trouble call from a clinical unit, you could easily take this in hand, go up, uh, let them trade out the infusion device on the patient. You can take that suspect uh, infusion device aside Run a quick check to see, is it failing or is it not? If it's not failing, you can schedule and do an in-service with the nurse or, or clinicians that had the problem and resolve your human error problem there. And that medical, that infusion device does not need to come back down to the shop. It can stay where it is because it's working fine. So it gives you uh, the ability to do something that is very difficult to do using any other test measurement method, okay? So consider that. Um, you can even get a, um, more information from us about that. Um, here's a little bit about the uh, specifications on this. For actual specifications, the exact specs are always found in our user manuals and user manual supplements that are downloadable from our website. This is an example in the picture of using an IDA-5, in this case, to do batch testing of infusion devices in a busy OR here in the Seattle area. 
Let's take a look at the IDA5, built-in automatic testing, plug and play data entry and printing directly from the device, widest flow rate capability in the industry, fully compliant with the international standard for um, infusion devices when used with the software, test four pumps altogether or uh, four, one four channel infusion device or two two-channel infusion devices, and it's upgradable. So you could crawl, walk, run your way to four-channel capability here by buying a one-channel or a two-channel and then upgrading during your annual calibration uh, of this device. So it gives you a little way to be able to make your uh, device a little bit more affordable in order to get into it. It's fast. It's accurate. And it's proven. The management technologies have over 20 years of demonstrated accuracy and, and uh, reliability. Test any brand or model of infusion device. We don't care what the delivery technology is in the infusion device. We can do the test with either the IDA5 or the IDA1S. So when you automate, onboard automation here means that we set up the infusion pump, prime it, and let the ID5 do the work because we've pre-programmed a testing auto sequence. So select the template or auto sequence we want to run, run the test, print or save the, the uh, management results, and we provide uh, software um, to be able to do that. Designed for comprehensive testing. Here's a little bit about the comparative capability um, of our uh, prior model IDA4 Plus against the IDA5 and the IDA1S. So you get a little bit of an idea of what we've done. It's all about safety, reliability, and efficiency. And we want you to, if you want to learn more, you can visit our Fluke Biomedical Advantage Training Center at the website shown below. And you can get free on-demand training. Uh, there are quizzes in each course that lead to certificates of completion, which allow those of you who are certified uh, CBETs like me to maintain your CBET um, uh, certification without having to go back and take the test over and over again. Those certificates are evidence of training and you want to uh, be sure that you use them for that purpose in, in your uh, recertification plan. There are white papers, application notes, videos, ROI calculators, and frequently asked questions all on our website these are also reused in each of the courses, so you'll see them multiple times. And uh, I think you then want to keep in touch with us on social media. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to see your posts and pictures that you're taking about how you're using, how you're doing testing, things like that. And you certainly can find things that we're putting out there on all of these social media sites as well. And if you need, you can request a quote or a demo of any of the products you've seen in today's webinar, just go to flukebiomedical.com, click on the quote or demo box, and uh, uh, or you can email sales at flukebiomedical.com. Thank you very much for your time today, and I hope that you will take advantage of advanced training and use Fluke Biomedical products. Thank you very much.